Welcome to This Week in South Carolina. I'm Gavin Jackson. This week, lawmakers return to Columbia to begin their new legislative session. We talk with two reporters about what their legislative priorities are for the session and what the governor said during his State of the State address. And in Congress, House members voted to impeach President Donald Trump again. We speak with Congressman Tom Rice, a Republican, who voted to impeach the president. Now the latest from this week. 124 House members and 46 Senate members returned to Columbia this week to start the new two-year legislative session. Lawmakers are in session Tuesday through Thursday up until early May and have a lot of work to catch up on after their shortened session last year due to COVID-19. Senators are required to wear masks in the chamber and security is tight as threats against all 50 state capitals have emerged following the capital siege. But despite COVID-19 concerns, some traditions continued, including the governor delivering his State of the State address in person, where he laid out his legislative agenda and budget priorities for the year, and also had words of unity for the state. We are not competitors. We are all on the same team, a team with different jerseys, representing different ideas, philosophies, perspectives, and experiences, but a team nonetheless committed to doing what we think is best for the future prosperity, success, health, and happiness of over 5 million South Carolinians. The governor gave his speech just a few short hours after House members in Washington voted to impeach President Donald Trump for a second time. Republican Congresswoman Nancy Mays, who heavily criticized the president for the January 6th insurrection, voted along with 196 other Republicans against impeachment. But what we're doing today Rushing this impeachment in an hour or two hour long debate on the floor of this chamber, bypassing judiciary, poses great questions about the constitutionality of this process. I believe we need to hold the president accountable. I hold him accountable for the events that transpired for the attack on our Capitol last Wednesday. However, 10 Republicans joined the Democrats to pass the inciting an insurrection article of impeachment, including Congressman Tom Rice. And while all this is taking place, COVID-19 continues to rage in the state, but more South Carolinians are eligible to get the vaccine. The governor and DHEC said this week that those 70 and over are eligible to sign up for vaccine appointments. The news came as the state begins to transition into phase 1B of the vaccine rollout. But this vaccine in particular is our greatest tool to get this pandemic under control. We in public health have been working with all the tools available for going on a year now to control the disease spread, but it is this vaccine that's going to get us out of this pandemic. It's been a month since vaccinations started in the state, and we've received more than 313,000 doses. But only 101,000 medical professionals and long-term care residents have received their first dose. Joining me now to discuss the second impeachment of President Donald Trump is 7th Congressional District Republican Tom Rice. Uh, Congressman, thanks for making time for us. We understand you just got off a plane from D.C. and you're, you're coming to us from your car. We appreciate your time. Oh, well, my great pleasure. I, I always enjoy being with you and thank you for allowing me to speak with my constituents. Of course. Now, Congressman, tell us a little bit about your vote for impeachment on Wednesday. Uh, it's our understanding that you uh, were against impeaching the president uh, a few days before, but then... Uh, you were one of 10 Republicans who ultimately decided to vote to impeach the president on an insurrection. I was against impeachment. I was against them bringing up impeachment. What I want to do is try to bind the wounds of the country. And I would have preferred if they had allowed his last few days in office to run out without continuing this controversy. But if I have to vote yes or no, if they put the vote in front of me, the events of last Wednesday and his behavior in the week since, in my mind, is completely inexcusable and a complete abdication of leadership. Tell me more about this. Did you discuss this decision with any of your colleagues in the delegation? Because, you know, one of your uh, new colleagues, Nancy May, she was, you know, blistering her, her attacks with President Donald Trump, uh, but said this was too rushed, so she voted against impeachment. Uh, other congressmen, other Republicans in the delegation voted against it as well. Um, what are your thoughts on how they voted and how you came to this conclusion uh, to vote for impeachment? I don't like the process either. I would have preferred that we had hearings 
and gathered more evidence and such. But that being said, I don't know if the speech that he gave on Wednesday morning amounted to the legal definition of incitement of a riot. But I do know this. <clears throat> Once the rioters got into the Capitol and were ransacking the place and were beating Capitol police officers and ultimately killing them and heading to the door of the House and the Senate chamber, the president tweeted that the vice president lacked courage and the vice president was in that building. And I don't know if you have seen the videos of the mob beating the Capitol Police officers, but I cannot imagine what would have happened had they gotten their hands on the vice president. So in my opinion, even without any additional evidence, his conduct was completely inexcusable. And our job in the House is not to try the president. The trial, the trial will be at the Senate. What we have to do is decide whether there is a case to put to the Senate. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, the evidence that I can see on video and in the timeline that I took the time to look at for the last few days, it's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And Congressman, are you surprised that uh, more of your Republican colleagues uh, in the House did not vote to impeach the president, citing some of the, the, the things you just, you just said? Everybody has to make their own decision. And I understand the arguments about process. And they're valid. Mm -hmm. But from a perspective of protecting our constitutional system and the separation of powers, where the president sends a mob to the Capitol to confront Congress, uh, I think that it's an easy vote for me in terms of protecting our system of government. Mm -hmm. Saw, and then from a human perspective, to see what happened to the Capitol Police and to know that six people have died and hundreds injured. Uh, and it could have been much, much worse if those folks had gotten into the Senate chamber or the House chamber just a minute sooner. Mm -hmm. We would have seen perhaps hundreds of days, mm -hmm. and the president did nothing to stop it. He was watching it on TV in the White House, and he did an occasional tweet about the election was stolen, and I know how you feel, but let's don't be violent. It was a very tepid attempt. He had communicated only on Twitter. I can't imagine that any president in my lifetime would not have called a press conference, or done a done a uh, statement to the country. Mm -hmm. You know, would have had a live, televised, presidential presentation mm -hmm. that evening to try to calm the waters and, and to console yeah. the people who were injured and killed. And Congressman, can uh, you can you? Contrast this this vote that you took for impeachment with the votes that you took moments after that insurrection when you all returned to the Capitol to take up the Electoral College certification. You still voted. Uh, you objected to Arizona and Pennsylvania. You know, you can make the argument that obviously that was the reason this whole mob was incited in the first place because of baseless voter fraud claims of widespread voter fraud. Uh, but you still voted for uh, to object to those two swing state vote certifications. Can you tell us how that contrasts with what you did with the impeachment vote? It's two completely different things. On the one hand, we're talking about election uh, security and validity. Mm -hmm. And we had, you know, I, I studied on that vote and struggled with it for a long time. I made up my mind that I would not 
finalize my opinion until I had heard all the debates and seen all the evidence. And what finally pushed me over the boundary was we got a letter the night before from the president of the state Senate in Pennsylvania with 30 of his fellow senators asking us not to certify Pennsylvania's electoral college vote until the U.S. Supreme Court had reviewed it and laying out the, all the problems with the Pennsylvania vote. So I felt like, you know, there were legitimate problems with the election, number one, and number two, that Congress had a role. There's a procedure for objecting. If there's, if there's no role for Congress, why is there a procedure for objecting? So that's why I did it. I decided we'd have a debate. I knew we would lose because there's more Democrats in the House than there are Republicans. I was angry that the president was presenting it as a possibility that if Republicans only fought hard enough, that he would get four more years in the White House, which was never going to happen. Mm -hmm. He was creating all these unreachable unre goals that could not possibly have been met. Mm -hmm. And Congressman, and then he yeah. said, and then he said. Republicans in Congress are weak, and then he sent that mob down to confront us. I want to ask you really quickly uh, how you feel this vote will play out, the vote you took, and, and how we move forward as a, as a country and your party to heal with about 30 seconds here. Listen, I know there's a lot of people who are upset with me, and I know there's a lot of people who are happy with me, and believe me, I'm hearing a lot from them. And I, I know the president won my district. If this costs me my job, I hope it doesn't. I'm, I love the job and I'm honored to represent. But if it costs me my job, it was the right vote and I would do it again today. And again, some haunting images we saw coming out of the Capitol that I don't think are going to age very well going forward to a very historic Imagine vote. Imagine if those police officers being beaten on by that crowd and dragged down those stairs mm -hmm. would have been Mike Pence. Imagine mm -hmm. what would have happened while the president is tweeting that my, Mike Pence doesn't have courage. Some horrifying thoughts right there, sir. We thank you for your time, Congressman Tom Rice, joining us after just coming back from Washington. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Joining me now to recap the governor's State of the State address and to look at the legislative session is Associated Press reporter Jeffrey Collins and the state newspaper's Mayan Schechter. Thank you both for joining me. Hello, Gavin. Thanks for having me. Great to see you guys again. We got a new session going, so let's get right into it. Jeffrey, I see you're at the State House, and on Wednesday night, the governor gave his fourth State of the State address. Uh, I kind of want to ask you about what we heard in that address. It was about 45 minutes long. They do this every year. Uh, they, lay out, they lay out their legislative agenda, budget priorities. Tell me what you heard, maybe what stood out to you. It, you know, his, uh, Henry McMaster, when he does the State of the State, usually mentions the things that he mentioned the week before in his budget request. That's kind of been his thing. The thing that stuck out to me yesterday as I was listening is that almost everything he mentions has a pretty good chance of passing, mm -hmm. which is pretty unusual in the past 30 years with the governor legislature relationship. I mean, he's got the rainy day fund that's $500 million he wants to save that money. He's got step increases for teachers he wants to put in. He's got helping out colleges and, uh, you know, armory buildings. He's got all uh, some law enforcement help money, but it's all stuff that, you know, if I was putting money on, it's got a pretty good chance of passing. Yeah. And uh, Mayan, we've seen that over the past couple of years with the governor that he has been, has that good relationship with lawmakers. Unlike his predecessors, he doesn't butt heads. He kind of goes along to get along. Probably doesn't get everything that he wants, but he does get some things. And that's a legislative victory uh, in his book because, you know, that's how things work up there. You got to get along to go along. Uh, but tell me what you are hearing from lawmakers. We've seen about a thousand bills already pre-filed. They're, they're in the system now. They're going to be working through the system. Obviously, we only see about a hundred of them actually make it into law. What are the top priorities right now we're seeing emerge? Uh, obviously, it's only been the first week, but maybe what you're hearing and what we're seeing right now for priorities. Well, well, tagging off of what Jeffrey said, I definitely think the budget is obviously a huge priority of the legislatures this year. They didn't get to pass a new one due to COVID last year. So I would imagine there's going to be a, a lot of work being done uh, to do something this year. Um, I know that there's a, an emphasis, obviously, always every single single year on education. I don't think we're going to see a, a large 84-page omnibus education bill. Uh, uh, Representative Rita Allison told me a couple of weeks ago, of course, she chairs the House Education Committee, that we'll see probably individual pieces, things that have a better chance of, of passage 
Um, that could include, you know, testing, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of that is going to be solved through the budget, of course. Mm -hmm. um, we know that there's going to be an emphasis on edu um, on abortion this year. Uh, there is an about in 30 minutes or so from while we're speaking. Uh, there is going to be a Senate Medical Affairs Committee holding the first hearing on the, the fetal heartbeat bill, which we heard the governor obviously mention in his State of the State address that if you slide it over to his desk, he will he will sign it. Uh, so we know that that is going to be a priority. That's something that Republican leaders have 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 stressed in in the off season. Uh, we know Santi Cooper may come up. Uh, there's there's some hope from some lawmakers that medical marijuana has a chance. Um, but what what has kind of been more interesting to see uh, the greater sort of emphasis on, especially in the House, is this kind of equitable law enforcement, uh, criminal justice reform package of bills that the speaker has been pushing, that leaders in the House have been pushing, that seem to have a really great chance at passage, mm -hmm. at least, if not this year, next year before the session ends. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll oh, get and <clears throat> read this thing. I don't want to forget mm -hmm. about that. Now. Yeah, and we can jump into all those in a moment, too. Jeffrey, I want to talk about the budget. Uh, we heard the governor talk about it last night, obviously, and again, that's the top priority, like Maya was saying, of these lawmakers up there. That's the number one uh, issue. That's the, what they're charged with actually doing. By law, um, but it sounds like we're in a pretty good position compared to other states, especially after COVID just you know wreaked havoc on state revenues last year. Give us an overview of how things are shaking out and and where we stand as a state right now. Well, taking you back a year ago, before COVID made its appearance, um, you know we had almost $2 billion worth of extra money to spend. So that provided a cushion that allowed South Carolina to not have to cut its budget. Now, you know, they're expecting a little additional revenue that allows for a little few of those things that the governor wants to do. So that will probably happen. But in the end, it's gonna be kind of a status quo kind of budget year. I mean, you're not gonna get your extra cars if you're an agency or your extra stuff that you want. But the good news is you're not gonna have to cut employees or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it sounds like um, we know we're not looking for those big pay raises because, again, like you're saying, the recurring money is not really there. But there is an excess of one-time money, this surplus money, almost a billion dollars extra that they can use to plug these gaps like we're talking about here and there in these state agencies. Right, and there'll be some fight over that. I think, you know, the governor's $500 million rainy day fund is what he wants to do with most of that money. Um, that may be the thing, the place where everybody clashes a little bit. I mean, there's going to be some COVID relief things that are done and some things like that. So if there is a too big fight over the budget, it'll be over that particular bit of money, that one-time bit of money that doesn't come up every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they always talk about pay raises, and it looks like the only pay raises right now that the governor's proposing that could be mirrored in, you know, the budget in the, the state house going forward is looking just for step increases for teachers and maybe law enforcement. Is that uh, where the likelihood it will be at this point? Yes, the House Budget Committee is going to take up the, later on today, we're talking on Thursday, a bill that would reinstate the step increases, which are just annual increases teachers get based on their years of experience. That got postponed because of the uncertainty of the budget mm -hmm. when the pandemic started. So the Senate already approved it. So that would seem like it's going to be going to happen probably fairly quickly, like by February. Mm -hmm. um, the law enforcement, there is a small amount of money for law enforcement raises that would go to the agencies themselves to determine on merit. But as far as like broad across the board raises, it's just not does not look like it's going to happen this mm -hmm. year. And again, because money's tight, but at the same time, we're not cutting. So that's a, a pretty good position to be in. Mayana, come on, I'll go back to what we were talking about when we were talking about uh, race-related issues, criminal justice reform issues. Uh, you're talking about that House committee that was formed last summer in light of, you know, the wake of all the turmoil we saw in the country. Uh, House leaders looking to make some changes there, some uh, overdue changes, some would say, uh, specifically a hate crimes bill. Uh, because we are one of three states that does not have one on our books. Kind of tell me about that. And, you know, we, we have seen pressure from outside, big outside groups uh, pushing lawmakers to see one as well. What's the state of play right there? What's the likelihood of that happening? Yeah, I mean, it seems it seems to have a, a pretty big chance, of, at least in the House. Uh, we saw the speaker after a, that bill package came out of that full committee uh, put out a press release uh, basically announcing this, this package of bills. We've also seen the South Carolina Chamber of Commerce wrap its arms around uh, a hate crime bill. And so I think that there's going to be a big push in the House and a really significant chance that that passes. Now, the big question is in the Senate. Uh, some of us, of course, asked Senate Majority Leader 
Shane Massey, what his thoughts were on a hate crime bill. Uh, he said he hadn't seen it, wants to see how it would be implemented. But Massey, who is an attorney, um, said he wasn't completely comfortable personally of, of passing something like this. He, he doesn't want a situation where he gave the example of, of high school kids getting in trouble for just stupid things that they say, potentially. Um, but he said TBD. Uh, he wants to see it, wants to see it, how it will roll out. Uh, the governor, of course, <clears throat> has not said how he, if he would sign it and support it. Um, he did not mention it in his State of the State address. Uh, so that is also... TBD. We don't we don't know where it stands, but I would say at, at bare minimum, it looks like it'll have a great chance to pass in the House. Yeah, and I did hear you're talking about the Chamber of Commerce, and they're fully supporting that too. Uh, a lot of businesses calling for it, uh, and then also when you look at tourism, they made a good point. I was listening to one of the the speakers talking about tourism. You know, if someone's going to want to come vacation in our state, you know, the likelihood of you know potential some sort of issue. Uh, the state doesn't have a hate crimes bill a hate crimes law versus all of our neighboring states do, most recently Georgia. So uh, some things that some people might consider before they spend their money in South Carolina. And, and I and I also, I, I think this is something that the business community has also been, been pushing a lot. I mean, in the wake of what happened last year after the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor and others, um, we, we saw businesses, major companies, um, you know, pushing for, for change as well. I mean, that was part of it, right? People were calling on these companies to do something more, to be part of the conversation. And so I think this is this is kind of an example of, of that that we're seeing. And also, again, you mentioned that we're one of three. Um, you know, it looks a little odd when South Carolina is, is by itself on this, mm -hmm. on this issue, um, especially after Georgia passed it not that long ago. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey, uh, moving forward, talking about some issues that we have seen, you know, kind of stuck, Santee Cooper being one of them, you know, one of the biggest elephants in the room in the state house. Uh, kind of tell us what's going on with that. We've seen the House pushing forward with some reform legislation. They want to see it sold, the state-owned utility there. Um, but the Senate, not so big on that matter. Where do you see things going? What's How big of a priority will Santee Cooper be this session? Oh, Santee Cooper is going to be a, a bit of everywhere, I think. Um, <laughs> there are Currently, we have, you know, two chambers. There are three special committees looking into uh, Santee Cooper. That's a little <laughs> bit of legislative magic there. But what it actually tells you is there's like three different, at least three different directions everybody's going. Um, you know, the question is, do you want to sell Santee Cooper to a private or do you want to leave it there and do serious reform? I think everybody agrees serious reform. I think you're going to probably see a bill pass that allow, well, I shouldn't say probably. I think there's a chance that you'll see a bill pass that allows them to sweep aside the, the board that runs Santee Cooper and the executives and put in new people in place. Uh, the selling part of it to a private company, yeah, it seems a little more doubtful. The House seems enthusiastic about it. The Senate seems very unenthusiastic about it. And if there's anything you know around here, if the Senate is unenthusiastic about something, good luck in seeing it happen. Now, that being said, <laughs> Maybe the House gets a really good bid. Maybe it changes some minds in the Senate. We'll see. But mm -hmm. overall, you're going to hear a lot about Santee Cooper, and you're going to hear it sprinkled all throughout the session. Definitely a lot to look forward to. Very fun there. we got about two minutes yep. left in my own. <laughs> a lot of long days on uh, debates on there, the intricacies of that. But my own, uh, I want to talk about the Senate. Democrats lost a few seats in the Senate. They have uh, even less of a, of a stake going on there, and we've seen uh, some rule changes take place that are, will potentially limit some debate on some big issues going forward. We saw them change up leadership. Now Brad Hutto is leading the Senate Democrats. Uh, what's the vibe over there? Are they kind of like at a no-holds-bar no type situation right now where they can just say, okay, well, we're going to just keep fighting or do whatever it takes because we that's all we can do? I mean, what's, what's going to happen in the Senate these days with these big bills? I think that remains to be seen. I mean, I do think that there is an attitude by some that, you know, they, they need to make sure that as a caucus of 16, that there is a consensus that they can walk into the chamber every single day with a unified message. But, you know, let's let's be honest. Every senator has a different personality depending on, on what bill. Not every senator in the same party agrees on everything. So I, I definitely don't think that that we'll see, um, you know, that that unifying message all the time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I do think that there is a, a bit of an attitude by some that look, we are we are in the minority. I mean, just just the other day when when the Senate made that rule change, I asked a Democratic senator his thoughts on it, and he said, "I mean, what can we do? We we, mm -hmm. we don't have." the power and the bodies to, to uh, you know, combat that right now. Um, so it, it's a mix of both, but it, it'll be interesting to see how, how that works out. I, I, I do think that 
Uh, there is still going to be some of that effort of, of working with Republicans on certain issues. I mean, there are a lot of nonpartisan issues, and Santi Cooper is probably one of them, nonpartisan issues that Republicans and Democrats will need to find some kind of compromise to get things done. That, that I don't think. And Jeffrey, you wanted to jump in on that really quick and wrap oh. up there? Yeah, the uh, you know uh, there are six new senators this year of the 46. Five of them are Republicans. Three of them flip Democratic seats. Five out of the 30 Republicans being new, that's a sixth of the Senate's Republicans. And, you know, if there's one little thing I've noticed over the first couple of days is they seem to get along very well together. They've been a group that, you know, obviously you go through all that orientation together and you get to know each other. It'll be interesting to see if they can kind of create their own little block that gets mm -hmm. some things done that might not have been done otherwise. Mm -hmm. And they're all wearing masks in the Senate, too, unlike in the House. So it's that's a yes. big start to an agreement there. We have so much more to talk about. It required it. Yeah. Uh, well, we have so much more to talk about, but we're out of time. But I appreciate you all. Uh, we'll probably catch in with you all a couple more weeks as we see some developments going forward in the State House. Jeffrey Collins with the Associated Press and Mayan Schechter with the State Newspaper. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me, Gavin. To keep you updated throughout the week, check out the South Carolina Lead. It's a podcast that I host multiple times a week. It gives you the latest information about politics, COVID-19, and more in our state. You can find it on SouthCarolinaPublicRadio.org or wherever you find podcasts. For South Carolina ETV, I'm Gavin Jackson. Be well, South Carolina.